Welcome to Meekum Presents On The Move, brought to you by State Farm. It's the show geared toward keeping you up to speed with the latest auto news, event coverage, and expert industry insight. Now, here are your hosts, Matt Avery and John Craman. Hey, and welcome to On The Move. I'm Matt Avery, executive producer of The Transmission, and joining me is co-host John Craman, lead TV commentator for Mecham Auctions on NBCSN. John, I got to say, I'm really excited about today's show. We've got a lot going on and kind of operating off of a little bit of a different pace, but I think as listeners are getting more and more used to sort of our dynamic, they'll find out that it's sort of evolving, and we're really enjoying coming up with fresh content every week, man. Yeah, so why don't you tell listeners, who's our segment two guest? Man, I'm just so happy and so proud. Good friend and a frequent guest in the Mecham Auction uh, announce booth is Steve Matchett. Steve, very well known for being a uh, former F1 mechanic under the glory days of Michael Schumacher. He's a writer, historian, well-known TV personality as well. Probably most likely known for uh, F1 commentating. We're really looking forward to having Steve on the show. And then uh, we've got a good segment coming through up, something a little bit different as well. What's happening there? Yeah, in segment three, John, you and I will be sharing some highlights of consignments from the upcoming Mecham Dallas auction. It is right around the corner. We've had a lot of great additions in the last couple of weeks. And what you and I have done is we've sat down, we've picked out three highlights coming in at three different price points, entry level, mid level, and then money, no object. So we'll be going into what our picks were and why we selected them. But before we get there, John, why don't you give listeners the rundown of the rest of the schedule for Mecham auctions this year? Four big auctions left this year, Matt. The next one on the schedule is going to kick off October 15th through 17. That is in Dallas, and that is going to be a busy month because we're going to finish off October back to Indy. Uh, The Mecham Fall Special is going to be October 29th through the 31st. We'll be Las Vegas in November and then Houston in December, keeping in mind that the formula of all these auctions is the same for the remainder of the year. Three-day auctions with 1,000 car targets. Uh, They're nice bite-size auctions within the scheme of what Mecham Auctions does, but yet they're big enough to attract lots of great collections, some high-end cars, a lot of mid-range cars, and entry-level cars as well. So it's traditional Mecham, Matt, for the remainder of the year done in a different fashion operating under a lot of safety protocol we're doing checking temperatures every day we're do, doing social distancing we are all wearing masks at all times there's lots of plexiglass everywhere separating people and Mecham has really worked hard this year to try to operate our auctions as safely as possible and it looks good for the remainder of the year well speaking of big automotive events this past weekend we saw the return of racing to Indianapolis yeah I'm I mad mean, I just have to I'm a huge Indianapolis 500 fan. Since I was a little kid, I've had a chance to attend quite a few of the 500s over the years. Obviously, nobody able to attend it this year. There were no spectators. It was the 104th running of the Indianapolis 500. It was exciting up until the last five laps. I'll give you the punchline here in just a moment. Uh, first of all, Mecham had two cars in the chase. We had the number 24 car that was sponsored by Wix Filters and Mecham Auctions, as well as the number 67 car, which was sponsored by Salesforce force and Mecham Auctions operating under the DDR banner and that was uh, Sage Karam and of course J.R. Hildebrand actually did a pretty good job in the race. Uh, J.R. Uh, finished 16th and Sage got 24th which uh, may not sound all that great but the reality is I watched them very carefully watch their progress throughout the whole race and they really did a nice job of slowly and steadily working their way up through the pack as both of them started on the very back row and I'd like to do a shout out to the entire NBC announce team uh, was led by Mike Tarico, but Marty Snyder, Kevin Lee, Paul Tracy, Lee Diffie, Townsend Bell, Danica Patrick, Kelly Stavist, Rutledge Wood, Marty Snyder, all did a really good job. Now, keep in mind, Rutledge and Kelly and Townsend are occasional guests of the Mecham auction block as well. So these are folks that we've got a chance to work with and know in the past. A lot of fun to watch them handle the, handle the action there at the Indy 500. And one other thing before I get to the punchline at the end, uh, nice surprise at the beginning the show, Jim, Jim Cornelison. He is known as the anthem singer. We see him at a lot of Mecham auctions. He's a friend and a part of the Mecham family, and he sang Back Home Again in Indiana in his incredible style. So race got off to a good start. Fast forward to the end, five laps to go, quite a battle. Scott Dixon, Takuma Sato, battling it out for first and second. Horrific crash. Everybody expected it to be red flagged. They finished the race 
under the yellow, meaning that the driver that was in the lead at the time won the race. That was Takumo Sato winning the race. His second uh, win, by the way, 2017 and now in 2020, the first Asian driver to win an Indy 500. Now he's won twice. Scott Dixon certainly disappointed after he really dominated that race and showed he was the fast guy and totally expected to put pressure on Sato in the last couple of laps. Never saw that unfold, but uh, Indy made the decision to go ahead and finish the race under the yellow flag quite a bit of damage to barriers and uh, safety equipment on the track and they just didn't feel there was enough time to get it done so well john i know that um of all the cars maybe one in particular you were zeroed in wasn't one competing but it was the pace car because this year it was a corvette c8 yeah and it was really great to see it because the um the other cars the parade cars were Camaro convertibles which are great in their own right and I fully expected the Camaro to be the pace car but at the 11th hour they did decide to let the brand new all new uh, C8 Corvette paced the race and it looked great. It was a red one seen it out there and interesting it was being driven by Mike Royce. He's the president of General Motors. He was a guy that actually got to sit behind the wheel. So uh, all Honda and all Chevy powered vehicles but with that brand new 2020 Corvette uh, leading the pack looked great. And just a quick comment for those folks that wonder kind of what's happening in the power plant world with the Indy cars. Uh, I was kind of curious myself. These are all fitting a formula and the formula is this. 2.4 2.4 liters of V6 power, twin turbos, an RPM limit of 12,000 RPM, putting out about 900 horsepower. Power, will go, power goes back to a spec, six-speed, sequential, automated manual transmission, and the drivers actually have the option of shifting the transmission and a lot of great in-car coverage. You could clearly see the driver shifting the transmission. You could hear it as well, uh, gaining advantages and disadvantages with that. Fuel economy savings, helping the cars get slowed up and set up for the corners. Other race strategies coming into play. Very interesting to watch that. Incredible technology getting that much horsepower out of that small displacement. Well, John, changing gears, we've got some car news to talk about. And uh, first up, Jaguar is getting ready to celebrate an upcoming anniversary. March of 2021 marks 60 years of their very iconic E-Type. And what they're doing, they're, I think this is really neat. They are creating six pairs of E-Types. And the reason why they're doing pairs is that they are mimicking two of the first E-Types shown to the public at special events in Switzerland. One of them is gray, one of them is green. And so they are recreating those using existing 1960s E-Types. Jaguar Classic, the brand's in-house kind of restoration and parts supplier is overseeing it. No word on pricing um, and no word exactly on availability other than they are available now for order. But I just, I love it when brands celebrate heritage. I think it's so important. I think it keeps that passion alive. So um, my prediction is that we'll start to see these cars probably closer in the spring next year. Like I said, March is the anniversary. That's when I think we're going to start to see them show up. Well, we've already seen the early E-Type Jaguars, of course, 1961, the debut year, cross on the Mecham auction block bringing multiple six-figure prices. I'm going to guess that this uh, factory Jaguar authorized program, those prices are going to greatly exceed that. And I don't know if you had heard the story before, but um, Enzo Ferrari, when he first saw the E-Type back in the early 1960s, he made a comment at that time that it was the most beautiful car that he had ever seen. And I don't know if too many people are going to disagree with that. Well, and the E-Type has no shortage of celebrity owners. I know Steve McQueen has owned one, Frank Sinatra, George Harrison, Tony Curtis. So, I mean, they're They are desirable cars, and like you said, we do see them cross the block for big money. Folks at FCA continue to push the envelope. We spoke last week about the all-new 2021 Dodge Ram 1500 TRX. What is the latest news on that program? Well, John, speaking of hot and desirable, the launch edition is completely sold out. So I know. FCA limited it to 702 vehicles connecting with the horsepower that that engine delivers, and all of them come in this very cool anvil paint uh kind of a concrete bluish color they get a special badge they get tons of options and all of them are gone and they sold for ninety thousand two hundred and sixty five dollars a piece pretty incredible it, was, it only they were only on the market for three hours i'm looking forward to seeing the very first one uh cross the Mecham auction block not going to be unfortunately until next year but i'm sure as soon as those start getting released and out there in hands we are going to be 
seeing those, certainly expected to fetch well north of $100,000. Let's keep within the theme a little bit and give a nod to our friends at FCA for a celebration of horsepower for 2021. We've talked about uh, the TRX at 702 horsepower, but let's not forget that there's a whole new lineup of products coming out with some big horsepower increases. Let's start with the 2021 Challenger Superstock, 807 horsepower, 2021 Charger, Hellcat, Red Eye, Widebody, 797 horsepower. Even the three-row roomy family-sized Durango gets the Hellcat engine at 710 horsepower, and that is joining the Jeep Grand Cherokee Trailhawk that already has 707 horsepower. All of this had its genesis back from 2015 when we first saw the Hellcat, that supercharged 6.2 liter engine, legendary instant collectible in 2015, and hats off to FCA for really pushing that horsepower envelope. Love it. Well, along with that, John, they are pushing the excitement. This has been a big summer for the brand. They've had a lot of buzz related to new products, and that is going to keep going. We have another unveiling happening on September 3rd, this time for the Jeep Wagoneer and Grand Wagoneer. Yeah, and that has been... I remember hearing about this rumors rumbling that FCA and Jeep were going to create a real competitor for that high-end luxury SUV, and it looks like it's finally going to happen. My prediction is I think we're going to see a couple of different trim levels available probably starting in the $60,000 range to compete with the entry-level Yukon, but I'm going to say we're going to see content and luxury and technology, lots of capability to rival the Cadillac Escalade, currently really sort of considered, and the Lincoln Navigator as well, sort of the top of that heap. I'm sure it'll be close to a $100,000 vehicle. Right now, it's a lot of speculation, but officially, FCA has teased it and has announced that date for the reveal of September 3rd. Well, and there's not a lot to look at, John, but from the images that Jeep has released, it looks like they're going to recapture some of the essence of what the model was best known for, which is being more of a premium off-roader. Well, they are. Keep in mind, this vehicle's been around since the 1960s, early 1960s, and has gone through quite an evolution, ending up in the early 1990s as a very high-profile, luxurious, and some people would say even gaudy with that fake wood trim and the big white wall tires. Uh, Not quite sure we're going to have that kind of a vibe to the all new uh, Grand Wagoneer, but it's going to be really interesting to see exactly, Matt, not only how they tap into the heritage and the history of the Wagoneer nameplate, but even how the reveal plays out, as we saw with the TRX. They, they showed a couple of vintage Ram vehicles, which were which was spot on the way they did it. I'm just looking forward to the entertainment value of the, of the reveal as well. That's an excellent point, John, and we'll find out on September 3rd. Meekum Auctions is proud to bring you On the Move with Matt Avery and John Craman. For more on the world of collector cars, head over to Meekum.com. Now let's get back to the show. On the telephone with us today is our good friend and compadre, Steve Matchett. Steve is a well-known historian, author, mechanic, specifically as a Ferrari road car mechanic, and also fame with F1 racing under Michael Schumacher. He's a TV personality, huge follow- following, legions of fans. I'm one of those. Steve, it is my pleasure and Matt's pleasure to welcome you to our podcast. Thank you so much, man. Gosh, JK, thank you very much. What an introduction. I, I hope I can live up to that introduction. I feel like I'm, I'm going to be a terrible disappointment to you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I kind of have a feeling, Steve, that most of our listeners are very familiar with a lot of your work, not only uh, with Mecham Auctions, as, w- as we'll talk about in a bit, but other things. Hey, take us back to day one. Where did cars all begin for you? Well, it all, it all began back in the late 1970s in, in England. And I grew up uh, very close to a little town called Loughborough, which the only thing Loughborough is famous for is being off uh, exit 21, uh, exit 23 of the M1. It's kind of a very small, nondescript town. But over the years, um, Loughborough University has grown and grown and grown to become, I would suggest, Britain's leading engineering and sports orientated university um and uh alongside loughborough university and the great lecturers that are there uh loughborough is also semi-famous for having at the time i think one of only three ferrari dealerships that were in england called Hall motors and so uh when i left school 
school at, age, at the tender age of 16. I never went to university. I became an indentured apprentice. Uh, in the automotive industry, at a little uh, Mazda dealer, actually, in Loughborough. And um, I was so fortunate that the lecturers at our technical college, where I, uh, I, I went every, uh, every, every week as an indentured apprentice for four years, were the same lecturers that were working at the university. So I had tremendously good teachers. And also, one of my lecturers, Jeff Smith, used to work many years before at Great Hall Motors, rebuilding the Colombo V12s. And so he had an, he had an overriding interest in Ferrari. And, of course, um, I, I just became more and more interested in, in Ferrari because of the proximity of Great Hall. And then, lo and behold, which something which has followed me right throughout my whole career, um, a series of fortunate accidents, I, I, I kept applying and applying and applying for a position to be a mechanic at, at the Ferrari dealership. And eventually, I think they just got tired of me constantly writing and they just gave up and gave me a job. <laughs> so, so I started working as a Ferrari mechanic uh, in the middle of the 1980s in England. But with great, with great sort of, with that great college, Loughborough University at the side of it, um, I did very well, you know. I, I, I managed to come out of my apprenticeship with a series of uh, uh, credits and distinctions. And um, from working at Ferrari, it was only a matter of time before the lure of Formula One became too irresistible for me. But that was the start, yeah. All, all just luck and fortune, really. Well, so that's how you kind of got your teeth cut. Take us now the transition into the, the high-end world of F1 racing and your association with Michael Schumacher. Yeah, well, um, working working with Ferrari, of course, uh, even on the road car side, uh, and Greypool was uh, was known for its very high end restorations of old uh, '60s cars, particularly the old 250 uh, range of cars, sports cars out of Maranello, and obviously the 308s and the 328s and all the rest of the road cars. But very well known for its restoration, and as a result of that, we used to get the press releases from Maranello about the uh, the daily goings on of Scuderia Ferrari, and um, I became more and more fascinated with that. And as a as I had now achieved the position of working with Ferrari on road cars, I was kind of looking around, thinking, "What's the next move? Like, where would I go from here? Because I'm having a great time here, but what is the next move?" And obviously, you know, looking at the press releases from Ferrari, I thought, "Yeah, you know, Formula One sounds like an interesting profession." I mean, they're going to use more exotic materials than I've been used to. They're going to be using titanium and carbon fiber and a lot of composite materials. And, you know, that seems to be where I need to be. So it was a love of the engineering side of the cars, guys, more than racing, which really attracted me. And um, as you guys know, you know, the majority of Formula One teams are, are based in England. Well, I knew that I wasn't realistically going to be given an opportunity to work with a Ferrari team. I didn't speak Italian for a start which is going to be a major drawback for me. But I applied to every Formula One team in England, just like I kept applying to uh, Great Ball Motors and got a position there. And um, fortunately, Nigel Stepney, who was the chief mechanic at Benetton at the time, uh, looked on me very kindly. And in an act of charity, which I shall always remember him for, <laughs> he took me on as well. He gave me a job in, in Formula One. Uh, this was in 1990 uh, with uh, Nelson Piquet and Alessandro Nanini were our two drivers. And then, you know, as history tells us, in 91, uh, a young German driver called Michael Schumacher arrived on the scene. And uh, our boss at the time, Flavio Briatore, was very quick to snap him up and put him into the cockpit. Along comes Ross Braun as the technical director. And um, the rest is history, as they say. We, we just had an absolutely incredible series of sets. And I was surrounded by the most gifted designers and in my mind, still the most successful Formula One driver ever in the sport. I mean, Michael ended up with seven drivers' championships, and he won two of those at Benetton during my time with him. Um, and so that was it. You know, I was surrounded by brilliant engineers, brilliant designers, having a, just a whale of a time working in Formula One with all these exotic materials. 
And uh, that was my break into Formula One. And then, you know, I, I, I'm just going to go on a little bit here. The reason I got into writing books was because when I was trying to get involved in Formula One, one thing became very apparent. There was volumes and volumes and volumes of books in the bookshops and in the library shelves about the drivers and a little bit about the teams and almost nothing about what it was like to work as a mechanic in Formula One. And so I had very, very little reference material to draw on when I was trying to get involved in the sport. And I've always had a love of literature and writing. And I thought then, um, in my first two or three years with the sport, this, this story, just an everyday story of how to work in Formula One, what day-to-day -day life is like in Formula One, is going to be the niche that, that's going to allow me to write. And so I did. I, I wrote Life in the Fast Lane in 1994 as we were fighting for our first Drivers' Championship against um, the might of Williams Grand Prix Engineering. And um, once again, Weidenfeld um, uh, and Nicholson, one of the major publishing houses in England at the time, are now part of the Orion Group. Um, they looked at me very kindly, and I called them out of the blue and said, hey, I've got this book that I'm writing on. I mean, talk about naive guys. I, talk, I called them. I mean, took, how does this happen? I called, I called them out of the blue and said, I've got this book about Formula One that I've been writing. Would you be interested in publishing it? <laughs> and once again, talk about luck and fortune. My publisher there, Michael Dover, said, you know, Steve, that sounds like a great idea. Let's do it. <laughs> that was the, you know, my first book was published. Yeah, crazy. Just crazy days. Take us down the rest of your uh, books and also uh, kind of finish up with that discussion of the transition to now very popular, your audio books as well. Right. Well, um, on the strength of life in the fast lane selling so well, I, I decided that, you know, my time as a mechanic was coming to an end. I could see already, I've been around in the sport now for about eight years in Formula One, and I could see that there was really two options available to me. One was to stay in the pit lane for the rest of my life until I was simply unable, <laughs> unable to do anything else. And some of the old lags in Formula One, I mean, they've been there for 30 or 40 years, and I still see a lot of familiar faces now when the camera pans across the pit lane. Or the other option for me was to continue to write about the sport from an engineering-based perspective, or well, well, the inside of the teams. And so I took that route. And so I quit Benetton in uh, 98 and brought a ramshackle old farmhouse in the middle of uh, Cognac region, Bordeaux region of France, purely because it was the cheapest place I could find to live. I mean, I didn't speak any French or anything. Um, but it was, a, it was a way that I could reduce all my overheads down to the bare minimum. And I started writing. And, and so I wrote my second book, The Mechanic's Tale, which covered all 10 years of my involvement in the sport, from trying to get involved into the sport through working the first year to Michael and Ross arriving and all the rest of those exciting days to finally quitting and, and leaving the sport. So... That book, The Mechanic's Tale, uh, became, you know, you know, what my publisher describes as a minor success. <laughs> they were very pleased with it. And I'm very pleased to say to you guys that um, The Mechanic's Tale is still, to the best of my knowledge, the world's best ever selling Formula One book. And it still sells. It's still with Orion Publishing today. And curiously enough, not so long ago, two or three weeks ago, I called them and asked them if they would consider giving me the, the rights to that book back because they've had it now for you know some nearly 25 years. And um, uh, they said, Steve, you know, we want to keep it. We still sell enough copies of that that it's you know it's 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 a star of our backlist as they call it. And so I still you know very kindly, Orion still paying a little royalty on every sale. But yes, so for 20 years, it's 20 plus years, it hasn't been out of print. Um, it's been in constant print and, and now in hardback form and paperback form and now in audio book form, which I've done the narration of the story. Yeah, it's, it's, it still continues to be the sport's best selling book, which is terrific. I'm, I'm very, very, very pleased about that. So it's tremendous stuff. But, um, JK, you talk about the audio books and I, I kept being asked, um, if I would produce my books as an audio book, uh, in audio book form. And I decided I was going to do that narration myself because, Purely because working uh, in TV, 
folks have become familiar with my voice, with my cadence and inflection and uh, the narration. And I thought it would just seem um, odd or false or not correct to have anybody else do the narration. So um, I had to, again, teach, I've, I've self-taught in almost everything I've done in life, but I had to teach myself how to do audiobook narration and recorded them with a, uh, with a neighbor of mine. And, um, you know, put them out through Amazon and uh, iTunes. So they're selling, they're selling well, which is great. All good stuff. Something else you've gotten into recently is reading at dinner parties. Steve, tell us, how did those come about? A, a good friend of mine, Kevin Fielden in, in Charlotte, um, who runs the local Ferrari owners club, uh, cafe, Charlotte area, uh, uh, Ferrari enthusiasts. Um, he asked me several times if I would consider doing a sort of after dinner talk to his members of, of Cafe, the Ferrari Owners Club in, in Charlotte. Um, I, and I was very reluctant to do it because, as you guys know, you know, working in Formula One uh, in the announce booth, I, I've worked with Lee Diffie and, and, and David Hobbs. And with the three of us together, it, it, we have a lot of, fortunately, we have we have a lot of natural chemistry, and it worked extremely well. And doing after dinner talks with all three of us on stage is, is is a lot of fun. But I felt a little awkward by just doing that, you know, on my own, standing up in front of a crowd talking about Formula One. I felt a, a lot more comfortable having my um, uh, booth compadres alongside me. And so I kept saying to Kevin, well, I'd like to do something, Kevin, but maybe not that. And I said, I'll tell you what I have done recently. I've just recorded a couple of audio books. How about if I um, read um, one of my short stories to your group? And uh, Kevin said, OK, well, yeah, let's give that a go. Let's see, let's see what the take is on that. And um, Kevin arranged a little restaurant in, in Charlotte that would uh, close down for the evening and, and, and just open up to us exclusively, which means we could keep control of the ambient noise, etc. And the restaurant supplied dinner uh, and we managed to sell out the restaurant. And, um, and so what I did, I, I read my short story um, always Ferrari and I split it into three particular segments three segments so we'd have the salad course and I'd read a third of the book and then we'd have main course and I'd read a third of the book then we'd have dessert and I'd read a third of the book for the short story and uh, the, the reaction from the crowd was very very encouraging and so um, they seem to enjoy it it's something that very few people seem to attend I mean uh, book readings you know, they're not many, quite frankly, but um, it went down very well. Uh, the audience were very receptive. And so on the strength of that, um, dear old Kevin, he said, you know, let's try and organize one or two more events for this. And every one that we've done has been a sellout, which is great, which is great fun. So it's a great way. It's a great way for me to combine Formula One and my writing and uh, a desire to sort of share that experience with an audience. So all in all, it worked out very, very well. Speaking of Formula One, fill listeners in on how long of a career you had in the announce booth for Formula One and what your transition out of Formula One, and I know it was into Formula E, give us a little bit of that backstory. Well, JK, this is, I mean, you know, as we've said already, my entire career has been a series of fortunate accidents, quite frankly. And... My break into television uh, came in, in 2000, in June 2000. And um, as I described to you earlier, I'd bought this old ramshackle farmhouse in the middle of, in the middle of nowhere in France uh, to write and to restore the house. And it was one dark and it was a genuine dark and stormy, stormy night in the middle of France. <laughs> and I'm sitting in this old, old farmhouse and uh, the electricity, you know, kept flickering on and off and all that. I mean, it was classic, you know, it was classic sort of storytelling stuff. And I was wondering, you know, have I made the right decision? You know, have I really done the right thing by leaving the, the comfort of the life of Formula One to come out here into the middle of nowhere? And I'm pondering life in this way. Well, no kidding. Um, an email pinged onto my screen, and it was from a chap called Frank Wilson, who was running the Formula One uh, production and speed TV over in the States. I'd never, I'd never heard of Frank Wilson, uh, and I, I was on the point of just uh, clicking delete on this email. I thought, well, let me just read it, see what it is. I thought it was spam email coming in. And the email said, hey, my name is Frank Wilson, and I run a, a speed, uh, speed TV coverage. 
Speed Vision TV coverage. And uh, I've read your books and I like them. I think you give a different perspective from the engineering side of the sport rather than just from inside the cockpit. We're stuck for an announcer for one race, which was the Canadian Grand Prix of 2000. Would you consider coming over to the States and helping us for one race? I mean, I... <laughs> I thought it was a joke. I mean, I thought it must be somebody from Benetton who's, who's, who's winding me up, right? Well, no, it turned out to be perfectly true, you know. And I, I replied to the email, and Frank called me, and we set things up. And, uh, yeah, so pretty much from June 2000 until our conversation here today, I've never really been back to Europe. I mean, I keep flitting over back to Europe and, and coming back to the States, but I've been very, very fortunate to have a 20-year career in television as a result of that one email from, from Frank Wilson on a dark and stormy night in France. And, J.K., to pick up on your um, comment about Formula E, um, when uh, the current deal finished with NBC for Formula One, and so we were released from contract because we had no more races to cover. Dear old Frank Wilson, who had now, um, he'd, he'd remained with Speed Vision, and then it became Speed and Speed Channel, and then transformed into uh, Fox Sports. Um, Frank called me and said, hey, Steve, I understand the Formula One deal is coming to an end. We've got Formula E. Would you like to come back to the Charlotte studios and work with me again? So... <laughs> Yes, I said, Frank, of course I would. It'd be terrific. So, full circle, I'm now working back with Frank Wilson now at Fox Sports covering Formula E. Incredible. <laughs> <laughs> Steve, you've obviously got close ties to Ferrari, but any other automotive interests? Well, um, I have to say that the electric car side of the industry has really, really grabbed my attention, guys. And coming from a background of... of Formula One. Um, when Formula E first started, and it's now in, you know, five, six years old, when Formula E first started, it was, you know, it was it was treated like, you know, the child that nobody wanted to be involved in. It was, you know, it was kind of pushed to one side and you know, electric cars, what you know, what are you talking about? That's never gonna work. But Formula E just dug their heels in and started improving and improving and improving their product. And I, I, along with many others in the pit lane, started to look at them with a sort of fresh look and think, you know, these guys are doing, these guys are really getting on with the program. And as we all know, one of the biggest shortfalls so far with the electric car market has been the durability of the battery, right? The, you know, the, the, the biggest criticism has always been, well, how far can we run the car before we have to stop and charge it and we're going to get stuck in the middle of nowhere, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And when For Formula E first started, that was definitely one of their issues, that they could not get the car to run a full race distance. It would only get halfway through before the battery was depleted. And so the drivers were required to come drive back into the pit lane and physically jump from one car to another so that they would have a fresh battery and a fresh car to complete the rest of the race. Well, personally, I thought that all this is doing is highlighting the shortcomings of, of, of battery life and of, of electric vehicles. It can't be good for the sport. They need to address this issue. They, Formula E, need to come up with a way of getting the car to do a full, what they call an E-pre distance, a race distance. Well, sure enough, guys, when they produced the second generation car a couple of years ago, the, what they call the Gen 2 car, in one fell swoop, they managed to get the battery to do a full distance. So gone were the days of having to change car halfway through the race. Now, if you, if you equate that to advances in the piston engine world, right? I mean, that is a colossal jump in technology in one year. We've gone from not being able to complete an E-pre distance, we can only get halfway to a full E-pre distance in one iteration of a car. When that happened, I became incredibly interested in the sport. I thought these engineers are really on the case, really on the ball. So that got my interest involved in, in Formula E, and now I'm a, an absolute convertee, and I think they are doing tremendously good stuff. And I think, Matt, going back to your question of my other automotive interests, 
I think that has now changed my opinion of of technology in the road car industry. I think I'm, I'm more committed than ever now to the idea that electric cars are going to be the future of the automotive industry. I don't believe, and this is just my opinion, I don't believe it's going to be a hybrid engine package drivetrain that's going to do that i don't i, I you know i don't know formula one are still using that um uh, v6 with a curse technology kinetic energy recovery system etc on the car but i think already that technology as exciting and as interesting it is is not going to be the future it'll be fully electric vehicles and um you know you only have to mention tesla and look what tesla are doing i mean just look what tesla are doing in terms of their stock price it's just it's just going crazy i think it's gone up something like 400 percent this year alone right i mean so there's a lot of interest in tesla and there's a lot of interest in the technology surrounding tesla and also battery life and um so i would suggest that is going to be the future now you know, as an old guy, and I'm approaching, you know, I'm fast approaching my 60s, I'm always going to be fascinated by piston engines. I've always had a love of Americana. Um, I've had two or three first-generation Camaros. Uh, I've had a couple of old Mustangs as well. So I've always been a fan, a believer, a lover of um, American muscle cars. I mean, it's just they're just such fun things. But, you know, I can also see that the future of the automotive industry will be away from gasoline, with away from piston engines, and will be, again, my opinion, that it'll be fully electric. Lots of information about Steve at his website. That is stevematchett.com. That is spelled M-A-T-C-H-E-T-T. And Steve, is just a final thought, you and I have had a chance to work together over the past several years at a variety of different Mecham auctions, not only as a welcome guest in our announce booth, but also as a special presenter for some of our Mecham specials as well. Steve, you're always a pleasure to work with. We have really enjoyed our conversation, hearing a little bit about your background, and we're looking forward to seeing you, hopefully, I got my fingers crossed, man, hopefully back somewhere at a Mecham auction coming up soon. Hey, JK, I I would love that. Uh, um, Matt, it's been great to talk to you, too. And, JK, thank you very much for that. You know, I, I... I love working with Meekum, and I love working with you, JK, because you're a lot of fun to be around. You're a car guy. You're both car guys, and I get that. And, it, you know, there's a certain sort of – there is a community around the car world. And um, you're great fun to work with, JK. But I tell you the other thing, on a purely selfish basis, I always learn something when I sit at the side of you, man. And, you know, even after being around cars for 40 years – I still get a great deal of enjoyment when you say to me, hey, Steve, do you know why this does this and that does that? And did you know this wasn't on the 69 car, it was only on the 70 car? I I love that stuff, JK. So to work with you again in the future, I would be up for it. Definite, for definite, as soon as possible. Don't adjust that dial. On the Move, we'll be right back. Our program is proudly presented by Mecham Auctions, the world's largest collector car auctions. Now back to Matt and John. Well, John, Mecham Dallas is right around the corner, and I know you and I both are revved up about some recent consignments, and so much so that for this segment, you and I both have selected three highlights coming in at three different price points, a entry level, a mid-level, and then, of course, the always fun money no object category. So to kick things off, my first pick is lot number F95. It's a 2006 Cadillac XLR in red jewel metallic. I'm going to say it, John, these are underappreciated modern classics. I love love the angular stealth fighter design these things had. They had V8 power. This one has 320 horsepower of folding retractable roof. I just think that when it comes to open air cruising, these things are hard to beat. And I think it's also one of those things a lot of people forget. They share a lot of the platform components with the C6 Corvette. Those have always kind of fascinated me too, Matt. It's sort of the uh, high-end Corvette. You make the comparison to the Corvette, and that's very valid. In fact, they were even built in the same assembly plant, Bowling Green, Kentucky. They were not on the same assembly line. It was a little bit of a separate line off to the side, but uh, not Cadillac's first experiment with a production two-seat sporty type car. That certainly would be the Cadillac Elante that predated that, but I'm with you all the way. The XLRs always had appeal to me. I think they're really neat looking cars. Expensive, new, never really kind of caught on. Cadillac pushed that car, uh, and I think that that's that's a great pick. What do you forecast that car selling for? It seems like a lot of these kind of land in the 30s, and that's 
where I envisioned this one ending up as well. Now you mentioned price, John. Interesting. When this car was new, the sticker would have been over $76,000. So not cheap. No, more expensive than a Corvette. I went a little bit of a different path, but stayed in the GM family. In 1990, when the Chevrolet 454 SS pickup debuted, it just stopped me in my tracks because it was the first truck that I could remember that not only combined a performance muscle image, but also tapped back to the heritage of the SS 454. Notice the letters and numbers are reversed on the truck. So we've got one coming to Dallas. It's lot number T53. It's a driver, high quality driver. Of course, powered by that 454 big block right from the factory, 230 horsepower. About 17,000 of those trucks were built. And another thing I like about it is, is they stayed within the formula of an old school car guy, and I guess truck guy too, that it is a short bed, standard cab, two-wheel drive truck, which is also one of the hottest segments that we know in the Chevy C10s from 67 to 72 on the Mecham red carpet. So this is a modern era truck, fuel injected, four-speed automatic overdrive, great suspension, a true muscle look. I'm going to say that this truck's going to probably fetch somewhere in the mid-10s. What else are you looking at? Well, John, for my mid-level pick, I jumped in, I took the plunge, and I selected lot number S101. It's a 1967 Amphicar 770, and I just think these things are so cute, adorable. You can't help but smile when you look at them. This one is in white with a gorgeous red interior and it has a cute little Triumph four-cylinder engine. I just think they are so wacky and weird and the fact that you can go from land to water, they're half car, half boat. What a neat slice of automotive history. I think it's an interesting pick. I remember them as a youngster and thought they were quirky at the time. The thing that really stuck out was the fact that it sat up fairly high and that it had propellers in the rear of the car. And that always just used to amaze me. Never thought that it might necessarily be something that I would be personally interested in because like a lot of compromises, I mean, you, you'd mentioned it's half boat, half car. So it's probably not a really great car and it's not a great boat, but it can serve both duty. And that's the charm to it. They are popular. People do love them. And I think they're especially popular for collectors that want to add something really unique to their to their car collection. Yeah, and I see this one bringing well into the 50s when it crosses the block. Now, I got to say, John, not only have I been able to see these things in action, I've been able to experience it firsthand. Down at Disney Springs, outside of Walt Disney World in uh, Orlando, Florida, there's a restaurant called The Boathouse. And if you go there, great seafood, by the way. But if you go there, you can purchase tickets to ride aboard one of their uh, vehicles and their restored fleet of actual amphi cars. A couple years ago, my wife and I did it. It was an absolute ball. So you climb aboard. There's a captain who uh, pilots it around the lake, but you jump in, you drive down the concrete boat ramp, and then you go right out into the lake. The propellers kick on. We had a nice guided tour, and then you come back and you drive right back up the ramp. It's the coolest thing. I highly recommend if you're ever in that area, be sure to check it out. John, what about you? What is your mid-level pick? You know, I wanted to go with classic traditional American muscle, and I don't know if it gets any more classic than a 1967 Pontiac GTO, regarded by many as the original muscle car debuting in 1964. A lot of improvements for 1967, frankly, frankly, that I like. Number one, they went from the 389 to a 400 cubic inch engine, same engine platform, but with a lot of improvements internally, a much improved and flowing cylinder head. This particular one we've got coming up, lot number F-167, has got the optional 400 HO engine that's rated 360 horsepower and that's uh, you get that you get freer flowing exhaust manifolds you get a hotter camshaft open element air cleaner and it has the first year only another really big innovation for 1967 for the new all new turbo 400 automatic transmission finally debuted in the GTO and that of course replacing the original two speed automatic which was a very poor performer in comparison to the three speed turbo hydromatic and the really cool part is is if you ordered the floor shifter in the console, you got the Hurst dual gate shifter, also known as the His and Her shifter. This particular car has that. Uh, it looks like it's a nice, high quality driver, so it's not so perfect you wouldn't be afraid to take it out and cruise in it, but you're also going to get a lot of attention, shows, drive-ins, etc. Probably somewhere around the $40,000 range. Let's step up into the lofty high-end world. What have you got selected? All right, so we're throwing the budget out the window. My pick is 
lot number F165. It's a 1965 Porsche 356 C coupe and a really neat Kelly green. It's got great chrome wheels with wide white wall tires. John, I just love these cars. Iconic design, great drivers. This one also has an added level of interest that it was sold new in Dallas, Texas, and it's always been there with the same family. So hard to beat that kind of a story. I see this one going well into six figures. Yeah, those Porsche, especially those late 356 to 65 being the last year, so many improvements to that car, including four-wheel disc brakes. They really had that car dialed in. And despite the fact that that car uh, kind of was the end of the road, the 911 and the 912 replaced that, still so many people really like that body style. And if you want the best driving of all the 356 series, starting in the 1950s up through 1965, 356C from 64 and 5, those are the years that you want to pick. All right, John, if money's no object, what'd you select? Well, maybe even horsepower, no object as well, Matt. You know, the second generation Ford GT, 2005, 2006, always has had huge, huge appeal. One of the problems we see, though, is when, when those cars came out, they were almost considered instant collectibles, and so many people put them away and didn't drive them. And I have to guess all these years later that as they change hands with collectors, they probably are not going to be driven. So what I found is, is lot number S89 is a red 06 Ford GT with 2,150 miles. So what that tells me is it's low enough miles that it's considered investment grade and the car is essentially in brand new condition, but it can be driven. Why would you want to drive it? Well, how about 550 supercharged horsepower, Ricardo six-speed manual transmission, that retro styling that they just absolutely nailed, and it does have all four options. I'll just run down them real quickly. The options were, and this is all they had, uh, painted brake calipers, the BBS wheels, the Macintosh stereo, and the striping kit. Sticker price on this car new about $175,000. Wouldn't be surprised to see it cross the block at Dallas for almost double that, Matt. They're not inexpensive, but this one has the opportunity for somebody to take out and actually see what it feels like to crank that one up. Well, good pick, John. And if you want to see more about the selections that John and I made, be sure to head over to Meekum.com and don't miss Meekum's Dallas auction happening October 15th to the 17th. You've been listening to Meekum Presents On The Move, brought to you by State Farm. For more information, visit Meekum.com. And join us again next time as we take you inside the world of muscle and collector cars and more.